Hi everyone, today I'm doing a rewatch of the television show Twin Peaks. I'm currently doing a complete rewatch of season one and season two in anticipation of the new season that's starting in 2017. So I'm taking a look back at some of the episodes and just saying what I think about them. I'm currently on to season two, episode 23. And this episode was directed by Leslie Linka Glada and written by Trisha Brock. Leslie Linka Glada was a name that I wasn't familiar with before I started this rewatch, but since I have done the rewatch, um, I've become very familiar with her name. And I was listening to a podcast recently for another one of my favorite shows. Um, it's a current show, Pretty Little Liars, and the name Leslie Linka Glada was brought up. So she did, she did the pilot episode of Pretty Little Liars and she also did a couple of other very significant episodes in that show and she's also done a lot of other TV work um, directing such as Weeds, ER, and The West Wing, Grey's Anatomy, Numbers, The OC, Gilmore Girls, The Newsroom, um, The Walking Dead and she's currently involved in this series of Homeland which is a, an amazing show so she's got a very significant um, body of work she, I think it's a name worth worth looking out for uh, as as maybe a, a touch of quality to, to what you're about to watch okay so we get more about um, Caroline in this first scene with Cooper and Harry Harry looks at the mask and mentions that he thinks Caroline was beautiful. We we see the mask again and I think the mask means different things to different people. To Wyndham Earl, it, it almost dehumanizes Caroline. And yet to Cooper and Harry, the mask represents Caroline's ultimate beauty and is is like um a tribute to her beauty. Pete <laughs> Pete is very lovable, <laughs> he's a very lovable character and um, and we get a sense of his playfulness and his simple zestful life I think um, in this scene with Catherine and Andrew he is just <laughs> he's just having a very good time in life at the minute. I think Andrew Andrew points out that Catherine is a very hardened and steely and it's an obvious contrast in that scene. Catherine's temperament and Pete's temperament. We see Harry, uh, he's discovering obviously, obviously that he's he's suspecting Josie that is is in big trouble and is not the woman that he thought she was and we can see him getting more and more annoyed angry at Josie but also desperate because he doesn't want to lose what he's got with her okay so Audrey's interaction with the um, concierge I think it shows you that she's not having a, an easy time of it uh, adapting to this new world that she's living in uh, the concierge is rather rude to her. He defames her sexuality by implying that she is dressing to impress and he also has a dig at the the nepotism involved in her working at the hotel and not having to do any of the less glamorous jobs. That's an interesting shot of Audrey when we first see her, the camera pans up from her feet to her face and it is reminiscent of the first time we see Audrey where she's wearing those uh, rather old-fashioned sensible black and white shoes and she changes uh, she changes her shoes later on to, to a pair of uh, very sexy, very daring ones. Now we see her and she's wearing this business suit and her choices are much more conservative um, but she still looks very sensual and uh, feminine but in a more controlled manner it's as if she has realized that she doesn't have to exploit her sexuality by using these gimmicks to show off various parts of her body she can uh, dress she can dress in a more classical 
style and still look uh, sensational. So John Justice Wheeler appears in this episode for the first time. Uh, Bill, he, play, he is played by Billy Zane, um, who was a very famous actor now. And he, he obviously, I mean, if you were looking for the perfect sort of fit for Audrey to have a happy ending in the show, given that there are so few episodes left, and I think he would be a good choice of character. He's a very attractive looking man. He's rich, he's confident, he's well liked uh, in the community, in the business community. So I think that, yeah, he is a good fit for Audrey. I think it's, I think it's important for her to have someone at this stage of the series, especially when she has spent so long um, loving Cooper. And that relationship in regards to any kind of real romance or real connection other than friendship has been knocked on the head. I think it is important to see Audrey enamored by another another man and for her to have this personal journey. So Ed and Nadine have this heart-to-heart uh, -heart where, Nad where Nadine tells Ed that she and Mike are in pretty deep and that they've had a, um, <laughs> a very interesting uh, physical relationship and she wants to break up with Ed. Now I find Ed's reaction to that pretty interesting because he looks shocked, he looks surprised. He also says, um, you know, he brings it up that you, 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 were, you spent the whole night with Mike and she, when she says, well, you and Norma spent the whole night together, he says, well, that was f that's fair enough then. Um, as if he th still feels that Nadine owes him something. To me, it says that he is not really disconnected from that relationship, no matter, no matter what the state of Nadine's mind is. I think he still feels like their marriage means something. And his reaction at the end could either be concern because of her illness or it could be absolute shock because he doesn't want Nadine to break up with him. He doesn't want Nadine to go. It's, it's a bit hard to tell, but I do, personally, I do feel that Ed has a connection to Nadine that he just can't cut. Okay, so it's very sad to see Josie in this situation she looks like a nervous wreck and for once I think it's been very hard to gauge her to gauge her behavior and her thoughts and feelings on certain things throughout the series but I think that the way we see her in this scene with Catherine where she's asking for help she looks genuinely scared and she looks completely messed up. Okay. Okay, so Ben and Bobby. I just want to mention this scene because not many things age Twin Peaks, I, I think, uh, but the fact that Ben is wearing a shell suit. <laughs> shell suits were very much a thing of the late 80s, early 90s, I think, and his outfit in this is is one thing that has always stood out to me as as being an obvious indication of when this show was actually made <laughs> so ben has this crazy plan well not really crazy i guess ben has this plan to use a save the pine weasel campaign to prevent the development of ghostwood so uh, I don't know about Ghostwood, but I've always thought when thinking about the show and considering that it's coming back in 2017, I've always thought that Ghostwood would, would actually end up being developed because considering how rapidly the landscape has been developed over the last 25 years, I, I do think that um, Ghostwood is something that would be inevitable regardless of the poor pine weasel. <laughs> Okay, so Wyndham Earl comes into the diner. He is not very well disguised <laughs> um, at this stage, um, but I guess he is pretty brazen about 
thinking that he's not going to be discovered. Which is pretty crazy actually considering that he did that elaborate murder at the um, sheriff station and that he is a highly renowned criminal and that the whole law enforcement are looking for him and yet he feels he feels he is able to go into the diner without wearing any kind of disguise apart from dressing as like a lumberjack. Okay, so um, Shelley gets her section of the poem from Wyndham. When I first watched this show, back when I was a kid, um, the poem really stood out to me um, as being so beautiful. It's called Love's Philosophy by Shelley, Percy, she Percy Bice Shelley. Shelley was part of the Romantic Poets, I believe, and his work contains like um, a degree of pantheism. So his writings focus on issue, focus on the idea that there is sort of a powerful force within nature that is a spiritual force, and that very much embodies the idea of Twin Peaks. As a, as a town overall, I think. So it's a very apt poem for Wyndham to have chosen. Okay, so that scene with Norma talking to Hank in prison, um, it's very satisfying, I feel, because Norma has spent a long time um, dilly-dallying with Ed, yet being like a doormat to Hank and doing whatever he asks her to against her own happiness, against her own wishes and it's very satisfying to finally see Norma stand up and tell Hank, you know, it's over. I do think that, you know, her moments with Ed, her scene with Ed before this, gave her that confidence to be able to do that and would she have been able to to get rid of Hank if, if Ed hadn't have been an option for her, would she have gotten rid of Hank? Okay, so it's interesting that we see Josie in pretty much the exact scene as we saw her in the pilot looking in the mirror, looking at her own reflection and her own beauty. I don't think it's, it's not just, you know, looking at her beauty and looking at what she is, looking at who she is, examining um, her own personality, her own character, her good traits, her bad traits, that's, you know, she's self she, it's, it's, a, it's a very vivid self-examination that seems to be going on when she gazes into these mirrors um, and the fact that we see this scene repeated it almost feels like Josie's story has come full circle and the beginning reflects the end. Okay, so it's a bit weird to see James and the James and Donna storyline. Uh, quite late in this episode we get that scene where they talk to each other at the picnic and Donna she lets James go basically she she seems to know that James hasn't still hasn't come to terms with with what happened in Twin Peaks to to Laura and to Madeline and all that you know everything that James has had to deal with Donna realizes that he he hasn't dealt with it yet he he was starting to deal with it, I think, at the beginning of of his relationship with Evelyn, but they say that if you love someone, set them free, and I feel like that's what Donna is doing in this scene. She clearly loves James very much, but I think she is completely aware that James's needs perhaps outweigh her own in this sense, in this um, situation, and that the only way to help James is to let him go and let him figure it out and let him be alone with his thoughts and feelings until he's fixed himself. Audrey and John Justice Wheeler, I don't know why I feel like I have to say his whole name, <laughs> but <laughs> um, they have a conversation um, in which she gets to know him a bit better and when she finds out that he is a man of the world I think she feels a little like her status isn't as equal as his. She makes a point that she's only 18 and that she's not well experienced about the world, about love, um, and he doesn't seem to think that's a problem. 
I do get the, a sense that Audrey is a little bit scared uh, of, of John Justice Wheeler and his uh, his complete um, competence in, in every area of life it seems including um, seducing women <laughs> okay so I really like the scene where Josie dies um, it's very intense the confrontation between her and Cooper there's a lot of there's a lot of anger from Cooper I think a lot of indignance from from Josie um, resistance to to taking responsibility and when Harry arrives on the scene it gets even more intense because he is barely able to contain himself he clearly um, is highly emotional and he doesn't want to be doing what he's doing he doesn't want to hurt Josie he doesn't want Josie to hurt herself or anybody else uh, Josie's death is a very weird one um, and I guess you can theorize about what happened to her um, obviously in the next I think it's the next episode we find out some very weird things about her um, body her body after death during um, like in the autopsy sort of thing it's very surprising to see Bob and the man from another place in this scene with Josie because they seem as if they are connected to the past of Twin Peaks and by seeing them again it it reconnects the threads of this otherworldly place to what's happened to Josie um, when Bob appears he cries out um, well I, I thought he cried out what happened to Josie Coop what happened to Josie but if you put the subtitles on it says that he says what happened to dead Josie um, which could imply something else because he's asking what happened to her when she is dead does that imply that he is taunting Coop by saying we have her we have her soul we have um, we've killed her and we've we've also taken what she was not at peace she's not at rest we and oh, obviously what we see next um, what we see at the end of the episode is does indicate that Josie has not had a, a peaceful transition into the afterlife her form appears in in a draw knob in this very odd scene one of the oddest scenes in Twin Peaks I think and one of the most scary I think as well it's very like Twilight Zone-ish when we see her face transform into this wood she looks trapped she looks in pain she looks as if she is experiencing an endless pain that I don't necessarily think that Josie is inside this this wooden um, furniture <laughs> but I think that I think that's just a representation of what has happened to Josie it's almost like Bob and the man from from another place are kind of mocking Coop and um, Harry I think I do think that's a very sad ending for Josie I mean regardless of what she did yeah she did she did a lot of wrong things in her life she made a lot of mistakes she she was self-seeking and I think that ultimately was um, a huge factor in her downfall she was endlessly trying to survive by by committing ultimate acts of treachery against other people um, and violence against other people instead of dealing with the situations in in a different way and it's difficult to know how to ultimately judge Josie but you you do feel that her ending and the fact that we see her like this at the end like that's her punishment for for all the sins she committed in life no matter why she committed those sins she still has to she still has to answer for them she still has to take responsibility another aspect a dimension of sadness in the scene with Josie is the fact that Harry is completely heartbroken and um, that love affair that seemed genuine 
is is ended now, um, is done. That's a very sad thing to see love die like that. Um, and it, you you do get a feeling that evil has um, triumphed. This is a very memorable episode, I think, and a very good episode. I think a lot of the audience, the viewers, have conflicted feelings about Josie, but at the same time, I think no, I don't think anybody could be cheering what happens to Josie in that end scene. I think I think the ultimate idea is that Josie is a tragic figure who has found herself in in a position where she is going to suffer endless torment for eternity. It, that's what it feels like and it's very sad. Okay, so that's the end of the episode. My camera went off midway during this episode so if there are chunks missing about me talking about certain scenes in the middle of the episode I apologize for that. Thank you very much for watching. You can subscribe to my channel if you want to keep up to date with any of the rewatches I'm doing. Um, you can comment below if you have any thoughts on this episode and you can also follow me at on Twitter at the Log Sadie or connect with me at Facebook at the same name. Goodbye!